Hey, everybody, welcome back, and it is 2024. And yes, we are going to go through those stats. We're going to do a recap on uh, 2023. Uh, we're going to break this up into chapters. I believe it was chapters. It was chapters, chapters. We got a little bit of trash talking going on. We are very competitive in uh, in our company as far as a group, uh, a good competitiveness. Uh, and uh, there's a little bit of smack, <laughs> a little trash talking going on out there. Anyway, nonetheless, uh, let's get the show on the road. And uh, hey, if you have any questions, let us know. Make sure you subscribe and share. If you're looking for super accurate information, uh, just look. Don't, don't don't trust what I'm saying here. Go back and look, and you will see we're pretty pretty much spot on uh, every year. But let's uh, let's let the games begin. All right. So first. Let's take a look at uh, what we got here. So when we come in and we'll take a look at 2024 to or 2023 to 2024 change and uh, look at that. So mortgage rates uh, basically end 2023, not too far uh, off from where we started. Uh, as you can see, we've got uh, some rates there that were uh, par pricing about 6.75. Uh, 6.62 really at the end of the day was uh, some of the numbers that we were looking at as we consider mortgage rates. Now, if you go back last, uh, you know, the predictions, you know, from 2022 uh, and then moving through the first parts of 2023 and whatnot, you'll see that we said uh, rates were going to get back down into the sixes, probably the mid sixes. And we got super close to that uh, with the, some of the changes with things that are going on. Uh, you know, with the market, with the feds, with the economy, with the 10 year and two year treasuries, with the bonds, with mortgage backed securities, we're going to talk a little bit about what's going on with those and how you're going to benefit those. And that will go into our predictions as to what we anticipate for 2024. Now, understand, these are my opinions. All right. And even the recommended uh, investment opportunities that are going to be at the end of the video, which you definitely should watch. Uh, again, those are my predictions. Those are what I am saying is what are good options, good things to consider, and how you should be able to plan for yourself based on some of this information because we're into this all the time. In fact, uh, I was asked a question just the other day saying, George, hey, when you do your videos, um, are you reading from something? <laughs> no, uh, they're all impromptu. Why? Because we're constantly monitoring these metrics. We're constantly looking out, you know, in the future, as far as six months, a year, a couple of years, five year predictions. Where do we see things happening? You know, so we can give you the best information possible. So you make the best business decision. There's no selling here. It's just really solid information for you guys. All right. Now, with that, let's get the show on the road. All right. So when we pop over here, let's get, whoop, let's pop back into here. Uh, look, 6.62% are the mortgage rates. Uh, we're going to go into those just a little bit more. But look at this. So when we talk about home prices, and I'm not sure why it highlighted the whole thing, because the whole thing wasn't highlighted before, because only a portion of it was. Basically, what they're saying is, hey, listen, interest rates proceeded to drop through the month of December, and that's why we saw a lot of buyers coming back out. Uh, it dropped down into the, to the mid-sixes. Uh, the feds absolutely, without a doubt, are talking about doing more reductions. Why? Because, listen, we are headed for a hard bounce. Bam! Uh, <laughs> that's why you're seeing not only you're not only seeing a pivot, and in fact, one of uh, the people that were uh, you know commenting on the market saying you know some people are putting too much you know uh, focus on the pivot. And my my initial response was to laugh and say, really, uh, the Feds are spending a boatload, no, an assload of money right now buying back treasuries that the banks are holding that are are devalued and yet they're they're paying them for that higher value to keep those banks solvent because of the commercial real estate and that's why i'm saying and a lot of other folks are looking at this saying hey this is going to be a little brutal which there's a massive opportunity also on the backside, right hmm. anyway moving on uh what we're seeing here is listen 
Prices did adjust. We said they would come in about four to six percent. We're pretty much spot on with that. Not every area, but a lot of areas. And when we take a look and we come in, uh, we've got Core Logic here, and what they're saying is, hey, listen, Selma Health, the chief economist, says home prices in Washington state markets have fully recovered from the 2022 losses and are now reaching new highs once again. Um, okay, not sure I'm 100% into that one. There are some areas that are still struggling. Look, uh, our inventory, not supply and demand, but our inventory has remained incredibly low. And in fact, one of the absolute nemesis for the feds is the fact that real estate has continued to perform incredibly well. We have the sellers, and you know, some people call it the golden handcuff. Some people call it, you know, the fact that they're never going to ever refinance or do anything again because they refinanced, uh, you know, folks in the 1.9, 2, 2.5, 2.8, 3, 3, 2, 3, 5, a lot of them below the fours. And we're, we've got some great numbers of people that did a refinance and they're going to stay there and they're not going to move because they just don't want to give up the golden handcuffs, right? They're kind of tied to it because and they feel tied to it. But guess what? Life happens. Life will continue to happen. Those folks, not all of them naturally, but many of them are going to say, you know what? I know this is really awesome, but you know, I need something different. I want something different. Our family dynamics have changed. I need something different. That will always happen. It's just going to be at a reduced number as we're going to see here shortly. All right. So as we come back and uh, we move on, you can see our little tiny red circle here that the blue line being in the inventory, which came way down, as you can see, uh, the red line, which is pended, which uh, actually started an upward trend. And then, of course, you know, we've got the light green, which is inventory and dark green. That is uh, the number of homes that physically sold. And you can see that we're actually doing really well. But you might say, hang on, George. Hold on. Now, some of those numbers we're seeing, well, Mm, they actually look uh, a little a little low. Everything was low in 2023, and we're going to go over that shortly. So just put that one on pause a second. So if we come back and we take a look at this, and then we take a look at the uh, seven-day average, look at this, 525 was just uh, coming in back on market, pended. Look at that, 702. Sold, 442, right? Look, that's a seven-day running average. You come back up, look at this. We've got uh, back on market. We have 131 homes back on market, right? Don't think that people have slowed down. They haven't. The market is still doing its thing. There's still a massive pent-up amount of buyers. Remember, there's there are a few very common denominators that happen during a recession or when rates come down. One, Buyers will start putting, or uh, sellers will start putting a few more homes, not a ton, but a few more homes back on market. We're expecting that spring market to be modestly aggressive, modest, the key word. Uh, with that, buyers come out because they see the lower interest rates. They want to start capitalizing on that, and they will draw down that inventory even more. And that is an expectation for this spring market. And there's a lot of things that you need to keep in mind as that happens. And uh, we will go into those later. But watching our economy, we're looking at what is going on in the financial element of our market here local. Hey, listen, there's a lot of garbage out there. I shouldn't say garbage. That's not nice. There's a lot of information. There's a lot of opinions out there. Okay. Just like mine. All right. But mine is focused. Ours is here in the Puget Sound area. Seattle, uh, Bellevue, Kirkland, East Side, you know, South County, North, you know, Snohomish, North Snohomish, you know, those areas, that's our focus. We don't care what's happening in Houston or Florida or Detroit. Who cares? Unless you're investing there, it doesn't matter, <laughs> right? It only matters what is going on here and now. And that is what is most important. So as, uh, as we continue on, look at this. So on our chart here, uh, average day on market for December. Okay, super interesting. If we look at it year over year, 2023 versus 2022, right? We had two days less on market on average, okay? Plus, we were 2% uh, higher, technically 2.1% 2 2 higher on our list to sales 
price. Why is that important? Look, that's super important because as we take a look at a list price and then we have a sales price, the closer to 100% means that, you know, the list price and the sales price were the same. That's what that means. If we're at 96%, we're just a little bit less. Okay, well, that's not bad at all considering where we were at time of year, December, seasonally a little bit slower, rates came down. It's actually pretty impressive. In fact, year over year, we did better. And last year between uh, November and March of this of 2023, no, November of 2022 to March of 2023, very aggressive market. Rates were down lower. In March, the rates started really kicking up again. And so people were, uh, were very happy during that window. Well, guess what? We had another happy window again. I guess that's the benefit of leaving the window open. Ha, there you go. Anyway, so as we take a look at that, understand we still have a massive pent-up demand of buyers. And that was very clear, including even just the last seven days. And it's January. Normally, January sucks. <laughs> and it's not. It's actually boom, moving very well. Uh, in fact, that's one of the reasons we had a little bit of trash talk, <laughs> trash talking because everybody's talking about homes that they're putting under contract and uh, with the with their clients and whatnot, which is super cool. Um, we're always happy to see success. All right, let's move back. So when we come back, we take a look at this. We have our pricing and inventory levels. This is super important for December, right? So the the red is 2022. The blue is 2023. So if we look at the left side, we have median sales, right? Well, look at that. Our median sales price, that's not, it's not a home value, right? That is a, that is the median sales price of what's sold. Okay. Now, as you can see, 2023 had a higher sales price. No different than if we take a look at the, let's pull that back up again. No different than if we look at our inventory levels, which went from, you know, last year, well, I guess technically 2022, we had 2.1 months of inventory where we had 1.9 months of inventory this last winter. So hang on a second. So people's perception that uh, the market is worse and it's December and, you know, it's just a poo-poo storm, but yet we dropped inventory. We had a higher sales price through December. And even with new construction, the same thing. How can that be? At B, because our economy here, which is one of the top five, I think we're actually number three nationwide for the most stable economies, which is going to be one of the factors as we roll into uh, 2024 in election year with some of my comments that some of you will probably have a heart attack over. <laughs> anyway, moving on. Look at that. December, without a doubt, was the seller's market. Okay, as you can see, the first highlighted section, a seller's market is when it's basically one third above, right? And as you can see, we had in we were at 48.6%, which was 8.2% higher than it was last year based on closed sales, right? Now, pended sales, we were 36.9%. What does that mean? Look, absorption rate is super simple. I'm gonna give you the super, super simple version of this. And it's my favorite analogy, people love it. I like it because it's a it's a great way to picture this in your mind. I want you to think about you standing at your kitchen sink and you got that sponge. And that sponge, when it is drier, right, it can absorb a lot of water, right? That's our absorption rate. That is the drier it is, the more we can dump into it. And right here, we were able to dump a lot of water into it, well, a modest amount of water. Uh, and and we took it and and it absorbed it, no problem. But when we have a balanced market, which is four to six months, not one. Not 1.9 months of inventory, meaning that if we have that bucket and we put all the listings into that bucket called the Northwest MLS, boop, I put a lid on it. That means we have 1.9 months of inventory to sell. That's not a lot. We should have four to six months. But back to the sponge. Sponge is super important because four to six months means four, four months of inventory. It says that sponge, as you pour a little bit of water, if you hold it underneath the sink or you pour a little bit of water in there, it just, it's taking it, but now you're starting to see a little bit around the, the bottom edge of it, right? Yeah, it's right there. Six, a little bit more water at the bottom, anything more, and that would, we can pour water in and water's just going across the, you know, the countertop, right? Okay. It's a great visual. Right now, our sponge is, well, it's damp. It's not dry. It's not saturated. It's just damp. And so we're able to put water into it and we're still able to absorb that. Buyers are taking that off and that is classic 
when we take a look at, you know, the seven day running average, where we still had more homes coming off market. Mind you, you might say, George, what's the big deal with that? There were still, you know, there's 500 and some odd homes that came on market. Okay. So there was a lot more appended that went off. It's January. First of January, all the people <laughs> that took their home off the market for the holiday, boop, put it back on the market again. They always do. So we always have that massive bolus of, of listings that come in. But guess what? The buyer said, give it to me, give it to me, give it to me. And they just took it back off. That's what's super important about that. It didn't just come on and sit. They came off the market because we don't have enough homes for the buyers that are out there, which is good. All right. Moving on. All right. So December was a seller's market. Why is that important? That's important because as we take a look at, hang on a second, the new construction, you can see that our pended were up 43.6% just for the month of December. And you can see that our chart here, the, the light green is uh, inventory, blue is new on market, pended. You can see that uh, that was right there with new on market. So everything that was coming on was going back off and sold, sold. We're holding steady. They were they were rock solid. Okay, what's important about that is that builders and the concessions that they are offering still are more advantageous than existing homes because there's just not enough homes out there, and that is benefiting a lot of buyer or builders out there because they have internal resources that they're able to mitigate that and uh, keep that ball moving. Because remember, they can't stop building. <laughs> the shareholders won't permit that, but the shareholders also need a profit, right? So there's incentives and there's ways that they're able to do that. And if you're working and looking at new, uh, at new construction, make sure the agent that you're working with understands how to squeeze out all the reserve extra dollars that uh, builders have that they're willing to negotiate with to get homes under contract. Uh, if, you're, if your agent does not, and if you say, hey, what kind of builder incentives do you get? for your clients, and they can't answer that clearly, immediately, and you may want to think about a different option. Just saying. All right, moving on. Okay, look at this. Bank owned. So uh, REOs actually, uh, you know, all things considered, uh, did amazingly well. When we talk about amazingly well, meaning that the inventories are super low, uh, that, uh, you know, we, we are still seeing a very low default rate uh, we are still one of the best or what we are considered a sweet spot across the United States with lenders. Lenders don't discount prices here for bank owned properties. We get some folks that are saying, oh, it's a bank owned. <laughs> There's more and better opportunities looking at fixers and rehabs than there is trying to get a bank owned property. Uh, just because one, there's so few. And in fact, you can, uh, you saw our number there, 11.8%. That's the wall of shame. 11.8% uh, of the foreclosures you see out there, unfortunately, are misrepresented properties, whether the seller or sometimes the agents are listing their own. Uh, we do, you know, do a quick shout out to them. Uh, hopes that they will correct our numbers uh, is the, the goal and to do a better job for themselves and their clients uh, and to take them off the, yes, wall of shame. So uh, understand that the foreclosure numbers here are actually lower than what you're seeing and what you see published. However, some of that is going to change. Why? Because when we take it 2023 at a glance, okay, let's talk about our, what happened through 2023. Let's blow this up. Okay, you can see, and we did uh, basically from July moving forward, and uh, again, these numbers are from the Northwest MLS stats, active listings alone, and you can see how 2021 has uh, had the least number of uh, listings. 2023 uh, was kind of in the middle for total, but notice 2021 and 2020, what was unique about those? Well, that's when you were supposed to be staying home and not buying homes. <laughs> and our market went crazy. In fact, uh, as we predicted, it went just absolutely eight. And we drew down into such horrific low inventory levels uh, that in my 30 plus years of practice, I have never, ever seen. And it was absolutely amazing to watch uh, and to experience. However, understand, 
all the other years. Let's pull that back up again. When you take a look at all of the other years, they're above us, and including a pre, you know, the pre-pandemic, and taking a look at uh, the year before, 2022, when we look at them, and you see that there's a massive disparity there. So when we pop over and we take a look at new listings, a new listing is a listing that comes online, right? Meaning that new on market. And you can see there's a massive disparity between 2023 and even the next one, which was 2019, pre-pandemic levels, when I kept saying, hey, our new on market is you know just shy of half of, of you know, we should be almost twice as much inventory, almost, right? At least 50% more. And you can clearly see that here. When we take over and we take a look at Pended, okay, some people are like, oh, you know, hey, you know, sales are down and, and everything else. Well, no kidding. When you when you take and you have your inventory is almost half of what it should be. It was, uh, we were basically 41% of the market, well, probably closer to 44% in change of the inventory pre-pandemic levels because we should have had on average of about 22,000 homes. And we didn't. We only bumped up against 10,000, I think like one or two weeks. And the rest of it, we were <clears throat> between seven and 9,000. We're horrifically low in inventory. Same thing here. When you don't have as many homes on the market, naturally, you're gonna have less pended and naturally you're gonna have less sold. That is very clear what you're seeing here. And when you take a look at these, Listen, uh, when we pop over to the solds, look at that. Again, the same thing. We had the same issues. But do you notice a commonality here? I mean, even through the pre-pandemic, pandemic, and post-pandemic, look at the trends, right? Here's your panda trend. Here's your new on market trend. Here's your active. Let's go back to that again, right? Notice they all mirror themselves, okay? Why is that important? Because we kept telling you that our market was situation normal. And you just clearly saw it. It is situation normal. And the biggest takeaway is the fact we just didn't have inventory. That didn't mean that the buyers weren't there. It's not like we had a massive surplus of, of homes sitting out there and nobody was moving. It wasn't the 2009, 2010 where our market times <laughs> were three times, well, not three times, they're at least double where they were at today, right? Okay understand our market is still doing well in 2023 and we have started the year. Yeah, it's only the seventh. No, all right, fine, whatever. Uh, but that has carried over and we're still seeing that momentum, which is super awesome. Okay. Now here we go. Let's talk a little bit about 2024 predictions. What do I think is going to happen in 2024 and how do you plan for the next step? Well, let's talk a little bit about that. So first of all, I think that again, we're gonna see a modest amount of home appreciation. We're not gonna see anything that is absolutely just bonkers and striking. We are gonna see things that are, well, I think relatively flat. I think that, you know, uh, there's not gonna be enough inventory coming on market to make it absolutely insane. I do say that, uh, you know, home appreciation is gonna happen. It always does during a recession. Uh, and interest rates always come down during a recession. The question is, is how are the buyers and sellers going to interact as far as overall inventory uh, and mortgage interest rates, employment, uh, you know, perception, you know, hey, you know, am I going to keep my job or not? <laughs> that kind of thing is going to have a huge role in that. With that mortgage rates, I think they're going to uh, stay between the mid to high sixes. Yeah, we might hit in the lower sixes. No, we are not going to see 3% mortgages. Uh, the only reason we saw it before is because they were buying all the mortgage-backed securities. And so interest rates went down because that's what happens, right? You dry up the mortgage-backed securities, make them scarce. When something is scarce, it carries more value, right? Kind of like our housing market. But you flood it with mortgage-backed securities, which are all the mortgages and whatnot that people make that are bundled and sent out to uh, hedge funds and REITs and insurance companies and, and uh, whatnot as a stabilized investment. Hey, you know what? The value drops. And of course, then the interest rates go crazy. Here, uh, I don't see them buying the mortgage-backed securities, so I think six and a half, 
Low sixes, somewhere in the sixes is pretty much where we're going to stay. Inventory, I think we're going to see a little bit more inventory in the spring. I think we're going to dry up. Uh, it just all depends. Uh, everybody, I don't care who it is, they're guessing, okay, our best educated guess or a wag, a uh, wild uh, guess, <laughs> is that we're going to see a, a, an aggressive spring and a uh, flatter rest of the year uh, as we get into our election year and whatnot. Institutional investors probably going to stay around the 8% mark. They're probably high sixes, low sevens for 2023. Probably not going to change a whole lot. I'm just saying, you know, they might bump up a little bit depending on inventory. But for the most part, eh, they're going to, I think they're going to stay a little bit lower. All right. Cash purchases uh, have been about 22% of the, uh, of the marketplace as far as closed transactions. That I think that number is going to stay relatively the same. Just, you know, the sixes are still a good interest rate. They're just not the threes. So I still see that happening. Uh, let's see here. Uh, remote living. This will be interesting. Some of the uh, outlying areas as the uh, return to the office is starting to come into play. Some of the uh, outlying areas, your Snoqualmie, your Sammamish, parts of Issaquah, uh, Monroe, when we talk about, you know, core east side Seattle areas. Uh, when we talk about Sumner, maybe Bonnie Lake, those areas that tend to be a little bit more remote that a lot of people were gravitating to, they're going to start to feel a little bit of uh, downward pressure uh, because they're not going to see as many buyers. And uh, Smash will probably be one of the, the one-offs on that just because it is a high demand area. But still, you know, inflation, cost of funds, cost of fuel, things like that access to, uh, you know, uh, you know, communities, you know, transit and things like that. It's going to have an impact on that as, you know, hey, costs have gone up, right? Okay. Uh, let's take a look at our next slide here. Uh, housing affordability is still going to be a massive issue. Okay. Uh, I think uh, what they say, 13% of the homes were actually part of the, you know, could qualify for affordable housing. And I think that's a stretch uh, with the cost of funds, uh, increase in home values, uh, inflation, things like that. It, it just, I know it's tough. I get it, but it's always tough. <laughs> it was tough when I first tried to buy my house. It's a matter of perspective. All right. It's always tough. Yes. That number starting to get down a little bit further, but there are other areas and other options to help to mitigate that. All right. Moving on. Rental prices. I think your rental homes. Yeah. 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 I think they're going to stay relatively flat. I don't see them going down. I see them just incrementally going up, but not by huge leaps and amounts. Uh, that will probably be 2025 if I had to take a wag. Uh, notice of trustee sales. Yes, I do expect to see a few more notice of trustee sales coming online only because the CARES Act that ended in uh, November 30th of 2023, uh, those borrowers that were on the edge that were when doing whatever they were doing, uh, they are going to actually, paperwork-wise, going to start coming to the forefront. Uh, there's a lot of different options. We still have a lot of equity in a lot of those homes. They will get on the market. They will get sold. They will not be a short sale. They'll probably more than likely get sold. That's why our numbers will stay not too far off from where they're at today. New construction, uh, I think those sales are going to continue to increase. Uh, builders, as the rates get back down, it gives actually builders a little bit more flexibility uh, with incentives to draw you away from existing construction uh, to get their homes and, and whatnot sold. Because besides, who doesn't like new construction? <laughs> anyway, with that, uh, credit. Credit's going to be a little tough nut uh, with CRE. CRE stands for commercial real estate, okay? Commercial real estate and the feds, that's what the feds affect. The feds don't affect mortgage rates. They can, they, they don't control, I should say, mortgage rates. They affect it but they control the lending that banks do for commercial real estate. And remember, they do five and seven year uh, mortgages, right? Where you do a 30 year mortgage on average, okay? And so there's a trillion, trillion two of commercial real estate that's gonna come due that they've enjoyed three to 4%. Now they're looking at seven to 9%, depending on points and type of investment. Hey, listen, uh, their business model did, <laughs> That's not, did not account for that massive swing. And that's another reason that the, the feds have to pivot. And remember, banks, banks, when they have a asset that becomes a non-performing asset, they have to take that off their balance book, which means that that is not lendable. 
They're that asset. And so that's why they need to free up a lot of these treasuries to free up cash for these banks so they can overcome and, and, and you know, basically stay solvent so we don't have that bank meltdown like what we saw of uh, three or four banks in 2023. I'm not going to get into the whole thing. If you want more, ask me more. But anyway, that is what I see. That's going to tighten up a lot of lending for mortgages. Um, so if you're on the edge, make sure that you're uh, buttoning up all your credit items and everything so that you fit within the into those boxes. Otherwise, you're going to be paying a lot more. And the par pricing numbers that you're seeing, you will not qualify for. All right. Uh, unemployment should re remain about the same. I think the numbers are going to bobble around a little bit. I don't see any massive changes in unemployment. The uh, drop-off or the uh, I'm quitting my job people, that number has significantly reduced, but it's been replaced by some of the uh, job losses that are out there. Uh, but there's a lot of industries that are absorbing them. All right, that's that. Let's move on. Okay, let's talk about some investment predictions. Okay, this is going to be a little bit more interesting. Understand, these are predictions that I personally have. Uh, you should seek your higher counsel. I think that's what they normally say. You know, this is my opinion, my opinion only, <laughs> and where I think things are going. Uh, I follow my opinion. Uh, uh, many other folks do also, and uh, they have done incredibly well. I don't make uh, very many mistakes there. Let's talk about investment predictions here. 2024. Uh, I think there's going to be a big upside in underperforming stocks. Uh, I do play with that uh, quite a bit uh, with John Easley at uh, Talus Investments. Uh, super smart guy. He and I uh, go back and forth. We do uh, we do quite well in uh, playing with uh, both short-term holds and, and longer-term investments. And I think that uh, there's very much a favorable option to consider in the stock market this year. Look, if you, uh, there's a lot of folks out there. <laughs> there's a lot of folks out there going to say, George, it's an election year. Election years suck for investments. <laughs> okay. That isn't entirely true because when you take a look back, 19 out of the last 23 elections um, actually have performed very well. Only four of them did not. Okay. And when you take a look at stocks, most of the year is good. Uh, September and October's, uh, statistically speaking, those suck and they go down, but November and December always brings them back. All right. Well, when you look at elections and election time and everything else, eh, you can kind of see how those all tie in, but keep in mind, uh, there are some great opportunities. There are some very undervalued stocks that are out there. You can absolutely jump into. Okay. Same thing with real estate. And you might say, George, that is just self-serving. <laughs> no, because I'm not selling you here. I'm not selling you anything here. What I'm saying is the only way to inflation-proof your investment is through real estate. Real estate is the only way to inflation-proof. You have a 201K. Some people call it a 401K, but this last year with inflation and everything else and costs, um, your 401K became a 201K, all right? Unless you're keeping up or exceeding inflation in the cost of managing those funds, you're underwater. Real estate, real estate is tax different. There's three different kinds of, of, of income, right? You have your W-2 income, okay? Uh, and then you have your stocks and bonds. Those who are taxed, mm, similar but different, right? Real estate is taxed entirely different. And that is one of the key reasons that your wealthy folks, your good, balanced, uh, uh, you know, financially stabilized families, if you want to call it, have a balanced portfolio of real estate, stocks and bonds and, and things like that. Why? Because uh, we may have lost money or you may have lost money in your retirement account that will probably come back and it always does over time, but the real estate has done its thing. And you said, George, what if the value of my real estate went down? Well, it only matters when it sells, but it's the income, right? And if your income is still in a upward trajectory, which I don't know of anybody that I have that isn't in an upward trajectory, uh, that hasn't changed. So you're still making those dollars. That is still happening. All right, moving on. You might say, George, I can't do those things right now. Sure you can. You don't even have to be a landlord, right? Let me blow that screen back up. You don't have to be a landlord. Look, there's options with DSTs. There's a REIT, 
Okay, that's a real estate investment trust. Uh, DST is a again a group of people that get together uh, that it is controlled by somebody else, and it is a portfolio of real estate that allows you to have an investment in real estate that benefits and appreciation, depreciation plus income without you having to manage it. Same thing with a JV investment. There's a lot of different opportunities that you can look at, still be invested in real estate, okay, but yet still not have to be hands-on. Okay. Well, that's still allowing you to stabilize that because as things appreciate, as rents appreciate, you get a better return. Okay. Cash on cash returns. There's a lot of different things. Watch my investment program. It'll delve more into that. But again, don't think, oh, I don't want to be a landlord. You don't have to let somebody else be the landlord for you. Sure, there's a nominal cost. Well, there's a cost for that. But there's still the, the hey, this makes a good investment uh, opportunity. And those are things to look at. If you have questions, put them down below. Uh, email me, call me, whatever it is. We can talk about that. I'm not going to delve too much more into this. But what if you're still saying, George, I can't do that. I can do something on a lower level, like I teach my nephews. Okay, let's blow this up. Here's something you can do. Take $300 a month. It's $150 per paycheck. Have it automatically put into a different account. Okay. And you'll do that for eight years. Okay. Now, put it in something that is going to give you an average of 8%. So if you take a look at, you know, if you're doing the... Uh, S and P, or you know the you know looking at the market, the market average ten percent over the last thirty years. Okay, if you do that for your until you retire, you'll have roughly well. Okay, so let's qualify that. It's, you know between twenty five and and thirty years when you get ready to retire, you'll have one point eight million dollars in that account only, based on compounding. That's the benefit of compounding, but you have to do it. and It has to be consistent. Okay, and there's, again, a lot of things, and there's some folks out there going, wait a minute. Okay, that's a simplified version, but that is a very simplified version. You can do that today. Do that over the next, you know, eight years, okay? Uh, and you can have a nice, better retirement because some people think they need gods and gobs and gobs of dollars to do things. You don't. It's right there. It's super simple. Anyway, with that being said, hey, listen, if you want super, for accurate information. Hey, listen, uh, like and subscribe. Get our information. Take a look at uh, the past information and let us know what you think because what you need to do is subscribe. Smash the subscribe button. <laughs> Make sure you share it with a couple of people that you like and one that you don't like. And listen, uh, give us feedback. We love answers. We normally respond to you in about 30 minutes. In the meantime, have an amazing 2024. I know this was longer. We'll break her up into chapters. Hope you have an absolutely beautiful weekend. I'll see you on the next video. Take care.